Not to start a homily on a bleak note, but I was reading some stats uh, the other day about uh, Christianity here in the United States, some, some research done by the Pew Research Center. And I was reading that about 50 years ago, so in 1970 here in the U.S., there was a very small percentage of people here that self-identified as having no formal religion. So only 3%. 50 years ago, 1970, only 3% of the U.S. population self-identified as having no formal religion. Well, fast forward to a couple years ago, and now about 25% of the country say they have no formal religion. And if we focus on young people, the stats are even worse. Almost 40% or those under 30, almost 40% of those under 30 say they are not religiously affiliated, that they have no uh, type of religion. Isn't this kind of wild? It poses many questions. On the one hand, like, what are we doing as a church? What are we not doing? Uh, we have this responsibility that people know Jesus. People are missing out knowing uh, the Lord. And also, there's a possibility of them not having salvation. It's also the question of the why, right? What is causing this? And it's a very complex question with, I'm sure, a very complex answer that I don't intend to necessarily have or, or try to answer myself. Um, but the Pew study uh, that did this kind of research did ask people kind of the reason where maybe they have left the faith. And the number one reason that people listed, especially young people, the number one reason they listed of why they leave uh, Christian churches is the erroneous belief that faith is incompatible with science. So the number one reason of why people kind of, at least in this study, said why they have left uh, uh, the Christian church or whatever Christian church they belong to was the erroneous belief that faith is incompatible with science. I don't know if you're aware of this, of this claim, but there, is, there seems to be a, a growing um, belief that faith and science are not compatible. That faith is just a complete blind belief in what ultimately amounts to fairy tales. And science 100 disproves the Christian claims and also so many things that the Bible says are true. But this is completely false. Faith and science, faith and reason are 100% compatible. They do not compete with each other, as some would say. Our faith actually has a very robust philosophical and rational foundation. I wonder if one of the things that may be happening here is that um, I guess with such a wide access to education, perhaps uh, we, we tend uh, to educate ourselves very much in secular things, but not really in religious things. So maybe uh, you finish or somebody has finished you know, high school, maybe even college, heck, maybe even more than that, maybe they've gotten a master's degree or a PhD, right, in secular education. Maybe their understanding of the faith still remains at about the level of a sixth grader. Of course, if this happens, if you have kind of this, this really high secular education, but this really low faith education, there's going to be questions that you're going to have naturally and, and good, good questions because you're thinking about life and truth. Uh, you're going to have really deep questions that you're not going to be able to answer regarding the faith if your faith education or somebody's faith education remains at such a low a level. So, as I'm not able to answer these tough questions, what does one conclude? Oh, faith makes uh, no sense. Or if it makes any sense, it's just this blind thing that cannot be kind of understood with some sense of reason. I just have to assent to things that are completely just almost irrational. Which is again false. But let me give you a simple concrete example of kind of how this could play out in one particular thing. So, Let's think a little bit about the book of Genesis. So the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, it tells that the creation account of how the world was, uh, was created by God. And it says there that God created the world in seven days. Now one perhaps begins to study a little bit of science, and one learns that uh, it actually 
probably was not seven days, probably took millions of years for the earth to be formed. So one may quickly conclude, well, I guess, I guess the Bible did get it wrong, at least on this one. But again, that's not the case. If one studies just some of the basics of Scripture, uh, maybe the book of Genesis, where the original language in which Genesis was written is the Hebrew. And the word that's used there for the word day actually does not refer to a 24-hour period. It just refers to an amount of time. What is more, too, just the, the, the basics of kind of interpretation of the Bible is that one should always interpret the Bible or according to the genre. So, so the Bible uh, is 73 different books, and these different books are different genres. There's, there's poetry, po 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 poetry, right, a poetic genre. There's a, po a, a apocalyptic genre, there's uh, letters, so like epistolary genre, there's also historical genre, right? The, uh, there's also prophetic genre, right? there's different genres in, in the scriptures, and so you interpret each text according to its genre. So uh, the book of Genesis is, is part of the poetic genre, right? It, it's poetry, which is 100% true, every single bit of it, but it's poetry. It's not a scientific text. So if one tries to interpret it as a scientific text, of course, one is going to arrive at erroneous conclusions. But if one knows, or study the faith a little bit, knows that this is poetic genre, then I can understand that this is trying to tell me deep truths about who God is, where the world comes from, what is the, the relationship between humankind and God, etc. Right? And we can make right, similar arguments uh, or similar examples like with evolution or the Big Bang Theory, which, by the way, kind of fun fact, I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, the person who came up with the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest. Whoa, really? Of course. And apparently, I was just learning this, someone was telling me this, when he first proposed this to the scientific community, uh, he was told, uh, keep your faith out of our science, right? Because it, it matched so well with scripture that they were like, no, you're wrong. Eventually, though, uh, the, the scientific community realized it is actually really fitting to what actually science shows, even though it's also very compatible with Scripture, and they had to accept it. Anyway, so the list goes on and on, but the point is, faith and science are 100% compatible. And anybody who says otherwise hasn't studied uh, the faith very much. Now, why am I bringing this up today? Well, the Magi, I, I see in the Magi a certain image of truth seekers. They were seeking the truth. In a sense, perhaps they were some sort of scientists of their day. They were gazing at the stars, trying to understand the world, how it worked, and perhaps what or who was behind that created world. They were seeking the truth. And I, as they sought the truth, where did this lead them? To Jesus, to God, anyone. Anyone who seeks the truth with openness will ultimately be led to find Jesus, to find God, and to find the one true church he founded, the Catholic Church. We must seek the truth without fear. As we seek the truth, I think there's a couple of things, a few things that we can learn from the Magi and their journey in their own pursuit of the truth. Just three main things I think we can learn from them. The first thing we can learn from them is that we should seek the truth with others, not just by ourselves. We should seek the truth with others. We see here that the Magi, like the word Magi is plural. It's not Magus, singular, but Magi, there are multiple of them. They're, they're seeking the truth in community. Now, traditionally, we, we kind of say there were three, three wise men, three Magi, uh, but the scripture doesn't say how many there were. And early church fathers uh, sometimes speculated there were more than three, that perhaps there were eight or perhaps even 12, right? They're seeking the truth in community. It's too hard to do it by ourselves. And so um, here, for example, in the parish, we have so many opportunities to seeking the truth in community. You have, uh, just to name two examples, a group of, of, of men called That Man Is You. They meet every Thursday, very early in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, so as to not compete with their work and their, their, their family schedule at night. And they, they have breakfast from 5.30 to 6. They study from 6 to 6.30, and then they discuss whatever they studied from 6.30 to 7. Every Thursday morning here in the hall, right? Seeking the truth in community. We also have uh, this group of, of um, for women called Walking with Purpose, different Bible studies that meet at different times of the week uh, and to accommodate different people's schedules, right? Again, seeking the truth together in community. Jesus founded a church 
and and we should we should be be part of the church, seek the truth uh, with others. This is the first thing we can learn from the Magi. Second thing we can learn from them regarding our, our pursuit of the truth is that we actually do have to put effort into it, right? Um, it's interesting that, so we don't know exactly where the Magi came from. The, the scripture just says the East. But scripture scholars um, have kind of like looked at that nations closer to I- Israel, right, in the East, and kind of tried to see, okay, here in which cultures, which countries would, would this type of term be used, Magi? And they, they found a, a couple countries where they think the Magi came from. And it stipulated then that the, the traveling time they had to do to get to Jesus was about a year long. They had to travel for about a year to find, find baby Jesus. Now that's effort, right? Putting effort uh, into the seeking of truth, right? And this is very unlike Herod and the people in Jerusalem. It's so, so fascinating, right? That the Magi get there to Jerusalem, they're asking about uh, the, the Savior, the Messiah, then the scribes get together, the chief priests, they say, oh, well, the scriptures say that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so they basically just tell the Magi, well, go ahead and go to Bethlehem and you find him, just let us know and come back, right? And Bethlehem is six miles, six miles from Jerusalem. But scripture doesn't say anything about anybody following along with the Magi to seek, to, seek, to get out of the comfort zone and maybe, maybe see if the Savior has indeed been born so we have to put effort into it and i don't know but perhaps it's actually never been easier to learn more about the faith than today uh, thanks to the technology right think of podcasts like uh bible in a year you want to read the whole bible in a year or have it be read to you and explained to you right just commit to bible in a year it's 20 minutes a day and by the end of 365 days you will have listened to the whole bible and have it explained to you so easy, just put it on your way to work. Or catechism, catechism in a year, same thing. 20 minutes a day, 365 days, you will have read the whole catechism and have it explained to you. Or initiatives like wordonfire.org or Emmaus Academy that also just provide so many opportunities to know the faith. And not just for ourselves, right? We want to put effort into not just for ourselves, but for the sake of others. People have questions about the faith, and then we don't have answers for them. And then they leave the church because we can't answer them for them. Like, it's, it's, it's an us. We have to know our faith, so we have to put effort into it. Second thing, right? The third, third and last thing that we can learn from the Magi is that we have to be willing to give our life to Jesus. When the Magi find Jesus, it's so beautiful what the scripture says. It says, they post- prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right? They see him and they give their whole selves to him. They prostrate themselves. They do him homage. They give him gifts. As we seek the truth, God isn't really interested in just satisfying our curiosity, right? He wants your life. He wants you. He wants your heart. Are we willing to follow where the truth leads, which ultimately is re- recognizing Jesus as King, as Savior, and then, and then giving our lives to Him, like the Magi did. So in conclusion, faith is 100% compatible with science. And if we, we think not, we probably haven't studied very much of our faith. We should thus seek the truth, right? And not be afraid of the truth, but seek it. Right? Knowing it will always ultimately lead us to Jesus if we seek the truth with openness. And as we do so, we can learn a couple of things from the journey of the Magi. The first is that we should do it with others, to do it in community, not by ourselves. We should actually put effort into it. We need to put effort into it. The last thing is that we should be willing as well as we seek the truth to give our lives to the Lord.